Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm joined by Dr. Liz Jackson to discuss whether or not we should wager on God. So, Liz, can you give us like a 60-second rundown of who you are and what your research interests are? And, of course, thank you for coming on as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. And uh, he sent me some questions ahead of time, and I think I think we're going to touch on some really fun stuff. So thanks so much for having me is uh, the first thing I wanted to say. But, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I did my Ph.D. in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. I graduated in 2019, and then after uh, that, I actually spent a year doing research in Australia. So I was a basically a postdoc um, on a grant there, actually on ethics, risk, and decision theory. So it was super fun. I loved it. I love being in Australia too, but also uh, just doing pure research for a year is like amazing. So that was really fun. And then I started last summer at Ryerson University, which is a university in Toronto, um, and I'm an assistant professor of philosophy there. So I get to teach this semester. I'm teaching like a couple hundred students about how to think critically. So yes. it's very fun. <laughs> um, we're going through all the arguments and validity and, you know, all that fun stuff. So so they're going to learn all about premise conclusion form arguments and yeah, we're going to drill that in their heads. But yeah. Hey, <laughs> I've got just the book for them. <laughs> oh, that's... hey, there you go. Do yeah. you talk a lot about um, like standard form, premise conclusion stuff? Yeah, in yeah. so much this. Yeah, so like I talk about even like the, the dispositional aspects of critical thinking, like um, intellectual moral virtues, things like that, um, tips for uh, good conversations, but also lots of philosophy and, and stuff and strategies for strategic thinking within the context of philosophy. So that is so good to know. You know, maybe I'll add that as like a recommended reading thing on the syllabus. I actually, I didn't know what you covered in that book exactly. I knew about the book, but that's super cool. That could be an awesome book for a critical thinking course. Because another thing about it too is like, I love the logic. I love all that. But it's fun to do some actual philosophy in it too. Yeah. Like not just make it about the deductive proofs or whatever. So that sounds really great. I'll send you a PDF after this. So. Oh, thank yeah. you. I'm honored. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, so now let's get into the background on Pascal's Wager, because of course that's what we're here for. Unfortunately, we're not here solely for critical thinking and philosophy, but we're going to do a lot of that. So, um, on the internet, of course, you'll find lots of misunderstandings of the wager. So, can you tell us what the wager is not? Uh, basically, just dispelling with all these different under misunderstandings? Yeah, definitely. So, I think one of the most important, I guess, misunderstandings or confusions is that it's not an argument that God exists. The conclusion of Pascal's wager is not God exists. Um, and I think I, I, I would be comfortable saying any argument that concludes that God exists wouldn't even be a cousin of Pascal's wager. Or like, that's just not what the argument's about. Um, so instead, the conclusion of the argument is that you should believe in God. So the conclusion is about what you should believe, or we'll, we'll talk about some other formulations, but the conclusion involves the word should or ought. Um, so it's not a claim like about the world, I guess, <laughs> um, in the sense that God exists as a claim about the world. So that's one, I think, important misconception. And I still call it like a theistic argument. And, you know, it's it's often still lumped in with arguments like the cosmological argument and the fine-tuning argument, and I don't think that's totally inappropriate. I just think we should be clear, like, what the conclusion of the argument is. It's an argument you should believe in God. So that's the first, I think, misunderstanding to clear up. Um, I think the second misunderstanding to clear up, and I think this is, I think, more applicable to at least my version of Pascal's wager, um, but it's not an argument that you should wager for Christianity in particular, unless you combine it with arguments that Christianity is the most probable religion. But these are going to be our more traditional epistemic arguments, not the Pascalian stuff. So, you know, an argument for the resurrection or, you know, some other argument for Christianity, and you could throw in some arguments for theism in there, I guess, but you would need to boost the probability of Christianity in order to make it an argument that you should wager for Christianity. So at least my version of the wager was not an argument that you should wager for Christianity. Um, so those are, I think, two important misconceptions. Sweet. And so in addition to the misconceptions, we should probably also get clear on like the background concepts at play, uh, such as, you know, credence versus belief, uh, expected utility and, and how to calculate it and so on. So could you take us through 
the relevant background needed to kind of understand the wager? Yeah, definitely. So I guess the first thing to say, and uh, at least talking about my versions of Pascal's wager, but a lot of versions like Pascal's himself and Mike Rota is someone who has kind of given a recent version of Pascal's wager. So many versions of the wager, I think, uh, make, make something like this assumption. And this assumption is that decision theory, which I'm going to say more about that, what that is. Uh, decision theory is a good guide to decision making. It tells us how to make rational decisions. So what is decision theory? Well, essentially what decision theory tells you is it tells you how to be means ends rational. So given um, your beliefs or credences, and I can explain that in a second, but given your beliefs and credences and then your desires and preferences, it sort of tells you how to act rationally. And it kind of, uh, what it basically does is it helps you sort of balance the risk reward trade off. Um, and I'm going to give an example in a second, but uh, it kind of tells you get like, you know, given if there's some payoff here, but the small probability here, how do we weigh those kinds of considerations against each other. Like you could think about like buying car insurance or something like how do you weigh the, you know, the small probability you get in this really big wreck against the fact that the extra car insurance is like way more expensive. Decision theory could tell you how to make a decision like that. Um, I guess maybe I'll say something quickly about beliefs and credences. Um, and I think we might mention this a little bit more at the end, but this is actually another area of research of mine. And this is my dissertation topic. But um, Beliefs are kind of the, the familiar attitude where, you know, I believe God exists. I believe it's raining outside. It's kind of this on off thing. It doesn't come in degrees. You believe it or you don't. Um, and I actually think we re really do believe things sometimes. We really do represent the world such that it's going to rain tomorrow or that grass is green or whatever. Um, but it's, it's, it is this kind of coarse grain state because it's this on off thing. And so some people say we need this more fine-grained thing to represent at least some of our attitudes and that's what would be called credences and I, I often say you can think about them similar to just how confident are you that something is true so you know I believe one plus one equals two um, but I also might believe it's going to be sunny tomorrow and uh, what's the difference between those two attitudes there's clearly some difference and the difference is that I'm more confident one plus one equals two than that it's going to be sunny tomorrow so I have a higher credence that one plus one equals two, then that it will be sunny tomorrow. So what a credence basically is, is it, it represents how confident you are on a scale from zero to one, where one basically just says you're 100% sure something's true, and zero is basically just you're 100% sure it's false. Um, and so in decision theory, I don't know how much this is gonna come up in the rest, but I'll just kind of explain it. Decision theory is often um, takes your credences as inputs, uh, it has implications for your beliefs, and we can talk about even using decision theory. I mean, part of what Pascal's wager is doing is potentially using decision theory to tell us what we should believe, which is actually just really interesting in and of itself. Um, but decision theory traditionally takes credences as inputs because they are more kind of fine-grained and specific, and you can capture these differences between propositions, you know, where I said, you know, one plus one equals two, and it's sunny. It can capture the fact that the probability of each of those isn't the same, even though I believe both of them. So that's kind of the belief versus credence thing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about expected utility or expected value. Um, so a common rule in decision theory is the rule that you should maximize expected value. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually not, not that complicated. So what it basically means is when you're acting in a certain situation, you're trying to make a decision and you're not certain about some relevant facts, like take the car insurance thing. You're not certain whether in the next year you're going to get into a wreck or not, right? Um, decision theory tells you that you should maximize expected value because you're not certain about uh, things that are relevant to the decision that you're about to make. And basically what you can do is you can put in numbers that represent your credences and your preferences, and then it will tell you whether you should get car insurance or not. And that's going to depend on how likely it is you get in a wreck and how much the, the extra insurance is going to cost. So the reason that it's maximizing expected value rather than maximizing actual value is because you're uncertain. So if you knew you were going to get in a wreck or you knew you weren't going to get in a wreck, you could just maximize actual, actual value by either buying the insurance or not. But in, when we're doing decision theory, 
in an, and when we're uncertain, we have to maximize expected value. And it's basically, it's almost like from my subjective position, mm -hmm. uh, how can I be rational, <laughs> you know? And if the probability I get in a wreck is low enough, I shouldn't buy that car insurance. And it's rational at the time, maybe for me not to buy it, but there's still a small chance I do get in the wreck and then I end up getting screwed over. So it doesn't guarantee you'll be rational, but basically what it, <laughs> the, what it represents is if I made that decision over and over and over and over again, uh, things would end up good for me if I maximize expected value. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give a, maybe a little bit more of a simple example that I think will illustrate this maximizing expected value thing. So let's say you offer me a bet <laughs> and you say, okay, you can either choose to play this game or not play this game. And if you choose to play the game, I'm going to flip a coin. Um, if the coin lands heads, I'll give you $10. If the coin lands tails, you have to give me $1. Or you can say, I don't want to play the game. No coin is flipped and no one gives the other person money. Okay, so assuming that this is a fair coin, we can actually use decision theory to figure out whether I should play the game or not. And because if I play the game, I have a 50% chance of getting $10. And if I, it, you know, if, if it doesn't land heads, then I would only lose $1. Be the risk reward trade-off, decision theory is gonna tell me it maximizes expected value to play the game. And then again, it's maximizing expected value because obviously there's a chance that if I play this game and it lands tails, I could lose a, a dollar. So it doesn't guarantee I'll get money, but given I don't know the outcome of the coin flip, um, it's rational for me to play. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I think it would be helpful probably for the audience um, just to say like what you do is you take the um, you take the possible options and then you take your credences on those and then you sort of multiply this, the expected utility of those, you multiply your credence to that. So for instance, if you have a 0.5 probability of getting heads and a 0.5 probability of getting tails, you'd multiply that 0.5 by the $10 you would gain, so that'd be plus five, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd lose a dollar, so that'd be say negative one, and then you'd multiply 0.5 by that, so that'd be negative 0.5. And then overall, when you're doing your overall assessment, you just add up those totals near the end. So it'd be five minus 0.5, which is plus 4.5. So you should take that because your expected utility is over $4. So that's like, that's like rich, you know? So, so exactly. I just, I just wanted to get that for the audience. Yeah. No, that's good. And I should have said that. And sometimes I guess I don't know when to go into the math or when to not, but like, it is really just multiplication and addition you know so it's not like we're, we're not doing calculus here yeah. you're really and and i don't know i so i part actually part of me wishes we could like drop a decision table free build but i think you explained it really well so it's like if you play the game your expected value is 4.5 if you don't play the game your expected value is zero so in that situation you should play um so, so yeah, it, it, you can do it using really simple math, but it's cool because as long as you can get the numbers right, I actually did this when I was trying to decide whether I should buy car insurance. Um, I did this. And as long as you can get the numbers accurate and like the tricky thing is estimating the probability that you will get in a wreck. But if you can get that accurate enough, this is a super, super useful tool. So I, I think it's really fun. <laughs> it's powerful. Okay, so we've gone through uh, just the the background. We've laid down, we've you know put to rest certain misconceptions. We've also uh, laid out some of the, you know, the terms that we need to use, like credence and belief, and so on. And now I think we can get into the wager itself. So uh, can you kind of spell out the wager for us? Definitely. So um, we can think about the wager as basically a decision problem. And uh, expected value reasoning is relevant for the wager, assuming that we're not certain that God exists. So let's just assume we're not 100% sure that, that God exists. Um, well, let's let's lay it out like a decision problem and, and the way we've sort of been talking about already. Um, so look, we have two options. We could believe in God or we could not believe in God. Um, and then we have two possible states of the world. Uh, God exists. God doesn't exist. Right. And. The thought behind Pascal's wager is this. Um, even if the probability that God exists is super, 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 super low, you have so much to gain if you believe in God and God exists and so much to lose if you don't believe in God and God, God exists 
that, um, you know, even if there's a really high probability that God doesn't exist, those the infinite thing you could gain by potentially going to heaven and then the infinite thing you could lose by potentially going to hell is going to outweigh all of those finite values uh, given the possibility that God doesn't exist. So if you have a credence of zero, you think it's impossible that God exists, this won't apply. But in any other case, if you think even God's existence is 0. 0.000000001 probability, then the, the 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 Pascal's wager says you should believe in God. This is going to be this is going to maximize expected value because you take that small. Remember, we talked about the multiplication thing. And now I'm really glad you brought that up, actually. Perfect. Oh, um, I love it. <laughs> Right. So you take that small, small, small probability that God exists, even if it's tiny, and you multiply it by that infinity. Um, and that's, and, you know, and then and then also the the negative infinity um, that that, you know, that is doing a lot of work here, too. Although what's interesting is you actually don't need both. You only need one or the other. But with both, it's even stronger. Right. And so then those infinite values are going to trump um, Trump the finite ones. So that's basically note, the oh, thought. Oh yeah, go I, ahead. I, I should note that I was I was holding this up because uh, I was just doodling it as as you were saying it. But um, I put both of these as finite on the bottom, um, just mm -hmm. because you know it could be a gain or a loss. It doesn't really quite matter if you have the infinities there. Um, no no matter what, if it's a plus or a negative, um, yeah, it, 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 the infinities kind of swamp that. Um, and I should also say that, well, you know, it's not exactly clear that. Um, let's say if God doesn't exist and you believe, you know, sometimes this is cast in terms of it's a finite loss because, you know, like you're going to church or other things. But, you know, like the psychological literature shows that there are actually lots of benefits of believing God. And so like and, and other sorts of things, you know, the kind of community that goes along with that. So I don't know. It's not even clear to me what we should put in those bottom two boxes. So long as it's finite, that, that's kind of what I want the audience to understand that it would it would go through. Um, so the argument goes. Exactly. So it, it actually says it's not really relevant what those finite values are, which is basically what you just said, because the infinite, it's relying on this principle that infinite goods trump finite goods. And you should always go for the chance that the infinite good over whatever the finite good is. And I think that's initially plausible, but we'll talk about um, some problems with at least relying on a principle that's too simplistic there, too. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So... <clears throat> We've gone through the wager. Now, are, are we cool to go into some objections now? Is that is that cool with you? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. Maybe I'll just say this before we jump into the objections. The version of the wager that I like isn't quite as simplistic as the one that I just um, gave. And actually, the one that I just gave, I think it's, it's really useful in this kind of context where you're sort of introducing it. But arguably, even Pascal himself didn't give that super simplistic version. Um, but I think it, it gets the basic idea across. And then what we can do is, as we go through objections, sort of refine it and talk about ways we might um, we might change it or modify it uh, to, to get around some of these, these objections. But just, I guess, worth noting, I don't actually know if any philosophers really defend this, this super, super basic version mm -hmm. of it. I think most people think you need at least some modifications, including Pascal himself. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the audience, I've got links in the description to uh, a relevant paper of Liz that, that she wrote on this particular topic, and it's it's reasonably accessible, so you guys can check yeah. that out. So, so Great. now we can move on to the objections. So we're going to cover maybe six or seven of them. We'll see. So the first objection that we're going to consider, it's quite popular. Uh, it's called the many gods objection. Um, so... Uh, one common objection, of course, is that the Christian God in particular isn't the only God that's epistemically possible that we should factor into our analysis here. The gods of other worldviews need to be included in the matrix. Many of these other worldviews are mutually exclusive with one another, and believing the truth of one religion will often not give you the payoff of another. So for instance, you know, the Muslim God might send all non-Muslims to hell, say. Uh, and with the non-zero probability, epistemic probability, with the non-zero epistemic probability, Muslim God included, being a non-Muslim will result in negative infinite utility, so long as it's not a zero epistemic credence or probability that you're assigning to it. And, of course, uh, 
any set of non-zero values for probability of Christianity and probability of Islam will give us inconclusive results because, um, you know, the belief in, in not belief, and we're going to have non-zero probability in each. And so um, we can make a similar point about a non-zero probability of a God existing who rewards atheists with heaven and punishes theists with hell. And so uh, it just, you know, when you throw in all these different these different proposals with infinities on the line, so long as you're not absolutely deductively certain that these things are false, you get this kind of many gods objection worry. So uh, how do you go about navigating and responding to this objection? Yeah, absolutely. So my version of the wager actually basically says, that's essentially right. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Um, what we need to do is actually incorporate the fact that there's these multiple mutually exclusive religions into our decision rather than just say that's irrelevant or misguided or not important or something. So so let me let me say this first. There's something weird going on with infinities here. And I think that's the source of several problems actually including I think the next objection we're going to talk about as well. Um, and what's going on that I think is a problem is it's this assumption that infinity has what you might call an absorption property. So what that means is Remember, we're taking the probability that this thing is true, and then we're multiplying it by the utility, and then using that to, to add that up to get the expected value, right? So <clears throat> the, the issue here is, it seems like, uh, at least at first blush, Christianity, Islam, all these other religions, and even atheism could all have an infinite expected value if we just say, look, Infinity times probability, okay, that's infinity, expected value, infinite. Same with Islam, same with this possibility that atheists go to heaven and theists go to hell, then atheism seems like it has a uh, infinite expected utility because you're taking that, that small probability, again, that's what we were talking about, it, no matter how small, uh, multiply it by infinity and it's infinite. It's infinitely, it has an infinite expected value to be an atheist. So what what we need to do is in my view infinity can't have that absorb absorption property at least in our decision making cuz because if it has that absorption property then all infinities no matter what the relevant probabilities are are exactly the same in decision in decision making and that that's just that can't be right and here's um Here's an example that I often give that I think shows this. And uh, it's basically just this idea, look, what if you had the choice between um, a 90% chance at getting some infinite good or a 10% chance at getting some infinite good? Uh, if we do this multiply 0.9 times infinity, multiply 0.1 times infinity thing, then they're both gonna have the exact same expected value, but that would mean you should like flip a coin to decide which one to pick or pick one randomly. Or if I give you $1 to pick the 10% one, then you should pick that, you know? And it's like, no, of course, you should go for the 0.91 over the 0.11. Um, and so I think this is kind of just this, almost like a, it's almost like a thing that people are just assuming when they make the mini gods objection without really realizing, I think that this just can't be right, you know? Um, so the the overall lesson is that probability has to matter even when we're dealing with infinities um with infinite values you want to go for your higher chance at getting an infinite good rather than a lower chance at getting an infinite good um and so you know there's questions about how do we formally model this like how do we kind of modify what we're doing in decision theory to to modify this and i actually think we don't have to radically modify decision theory we just have to deal with the way that we're multiplying by infinities we just have to do that differently um, and once we sort of do that what's going to happen is that the higher probability religions are actually going to have a higher expected value than the lower probability religions and i think that's the right result right you shouldn't wager for some religion that you think is super unlikely to be true you should wager for the religion you think is more likely um, and then if you think there's a super, super high probability that atheists go to heaven and theists go to hell, like more likely than all traditional religious claims, then you should be an atheist. But I think, in fact, most people are not going to think that that's more likely than all religious claims. Um, and, you know, we don't give an argument that that is because, again, decision theory, it's appealing to, to your credences and your utilities. Right. But we're saying for most people they're probably going to think that the traditional religions have a higher probability than this view that atheists go to heaven and theists go to hell. And assuming you think that, then um, it's going to be irrational to be an atheist and maybe even an agnostic. Uh, and 
if you're going to we're going to have the result that you should wager for the religion that you think is most likely to be true. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so essentially you're kind of just building in you're kind of building in your own, your response to this objection in advance into your very probability calculus, as it were, right? With your, mm -hmm. you set up the matrix like that, and then you, you kind of get this result with, you kind of get rid of this absorption property of infinities, and so you're kind of already just building in the response. So essentially that's, that's what you're doing, right? Yeah, and in our paper, <coughs> excuse me, we use, <coughs> sorry, just drank water and yeah okay yeah uh, in our paper we use ratios and then limits so or sorry limits and then ratios so we take the limit of um of religions as the time period gets longer and then look at the ratios like that they fall into what's nice about that is you don't have to multiply by infinities at all it's all just finite values by finite values but the limit function lets you model infinity still but yeah. there's different ways of doing this some of them are above my mathematical pay grade people use like surreal numbers and and different ways of modeling this but as far as i know at least the philosophers working in this literature um they agree that we have like probability has to matter when dealing with infinities and you know we disagree on maybe the best way to formally model that but that basic insight i think is what solves the mini gods objection Sweet. Okay, so now we can move on to the mixed strategies objection. So um, the objection essentially runs as follows. Incorporating infinities into decision theory gives all decisions, you know, we're kind of hearkening back to what you were just talking about, but I'll still go on. Incorporating infinities into our decision theory gives all decisions the same expected value. Pascal's original, original wager has been considered such a powerful argument because, if correct, it purported to show that your credence in theism doesn't quite matter as long as it's a positive number <laughs> greater than zero uh, because that number multiplied by infinity will always be infinite. Uh, believing in God has an infinite expected value. And so that leads to what's called the mixed strategies objection. So we can consider the following alternative decision. Flip a coin, okay? <laughs> if that coin lands heads, you're going to believe in God. If it lands tails, you're just going to do nothing. So while this lowers the probability that you'll believe in God to 0.5, this action still has an infinite expected value. And thus, you have no reason, so the objection goes, you have no reason to believe in God directly rather than flip a coin, and if it lands heads, you believe in God. So both options uh, under this view have an expected value. And we get mixed results with respect to our pragmatic strategy of wagering on God based on these kind of wager type uh, reasoning about infinite expected values. And so I know we kind of already touched on something similar to this, but how do you respond to this objection in particular, as well as to other objections to, you know, the legitimacy or illegitimacy of infinity in the context of these kinds of expected utility problems? Yeah, totally. And so what's funny about the, the mixed strategies objection, I really like the coin flip case. I think that's a really good way to illustrate it. But it ends up having the result that like having a beer after our interview has an infinite expected value and like, you know, eating a burger for dinner or like literally name any action. If it's consistent with you coming to believe in God, it's going to have an infinite expected value. So it ends up having this super weird result where all our decisions, not just our decisions about like what religion or world you to follow, but like every decision just seems to have an infinite expected value. And it, it's funny, like in some of the papers that talk about the mixed strategies objection, they're like, maybe there is a God, all our decisions have an infinite expected value. <laughs> like, look at this blessing from God. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a fun objection. Um, but yeah, so here's what I think is, is really interesting about I, and I like that you put these objections right after each other, the mixed strategies objection and then, uh, or sorry, the mini gods objection and the mixed strategies objection is they, are they actually both come come up because of this problem I was talking about with ab the absorption of, of infinities. So the reason that it seems like uh, believing in God directly rather than flipping a coin and if the coin lands heads believing in God. The reason it seems like that those have the same expected value is because we're taking that probability again, multiplying it by infinity, getting in the infinite value. And look, what, what's going on there is that whether it's, you know, probability one, I believe in God, or probability 0.5, I believe in God, that is being absorbed by that, that infinite good of heaven or whatever. And so once we kind of... <laughs> say, actually, maybe this absorption property, at least we should reject that that holds in our decision making. 
Um, one, and, and, and actually, I think once we sort of make the fix that was going to fix the mini gods objection, I actually think this objection's and going to end up uh, falling out as well. Because remember the lesson we talked about earlier, it's this lesson that probability matters, even in the infinite case. And so you could, we could distinguish pure strategies and mixed strategies, where pure strategies are strategies like believing in God directly or committing to God directly. Mixed strategies are like doing things that are compatible with some chance of believing in God, but not, not these pure strategies. So the pure strategies are always going to do better than the mixed strategies because Again, probability matters, and they're going to give you a higher probability of getting this infinite good than the mixed strategies. In the same way that believing in the religion you think is most likely to be true is going to give you a higher probability of uh, getting an infinite good than believing in some random religion that you think has a super low probability. So I hope that's clear enough, but the main point is that this absorption property is kind of underlying both objections, and once we fix that, um, I think both objections fall out. But again, this objection isn't something I'm rejecting or saying is irrelevant. I'm saying this is like a really relevant and important point to think about. It just means that we need to think about the way we're using infinities in our decision making differently. Yeah. And I, I guess I do want to add on this point is like some people might say, well, hold on a second. Like you're just debarring this absorption property in context of infinite expected utility so as to kind of save your argument. But uh, the, the response to that is like, well, hold on a second. No, it doesn't seem ad hoc. You know, this seems to be principled because we have a kind of independent, we have independent reason like the case that you offered with like, if, if we have like two doors, say, and one of them is 99% chance of getting infinite positive value and the other one is a 1% chance, like, we, we all know, we all know that you should pick the 99% one. So it's not ad hoc. It's not a kind of, you know, trying to, trying to save your argument after the fact. Uh, rather, it's a principled, it's a principled independent reason you have for debarring this kind of absorption property uh, in the context of infinite expected utility. So that's one thing that I wanted to say. And then um, the next thing that I wanted to say was, uh, before we go on to maybe, before I let you say something and then we go on to the next objection, is that all the, while you talk about in your paper limits, right, um, you could also, I think, do, you could also make do with finite but arbitrarily large numbers, right? Like you can, you can just make it, um, and that also seems to get rid of these problems because like if you just let the number be like a Google or a Googleplex or whatever it's called, um, well then you actually, the, if, even if you have like a 0.5 probability in one case, but a one probability in the other case, that will make a difference. That's one times a Googleplex and then a Googleplex divided by two, which is <laughs> double the expected utility. So um, I just wanted to, to mention those two points um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you before we go over to the next objection so that you can comment on those. Yeah, I, so yeah, so I want to make a quick comment on both points. The first point, yes, and I think it's important to really be clear. You're not saying like, oh, this objection means that Pascal's wager is invalid or unsound, th and therefore it must be wrong, so let's change the wager. No, 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 no. It's saying like, this objection is actually presupposing that's just something that's just generally false. And it just can't be that infinities have ab absorption property in our decision making. Whether we're thinking about Pascal's wager or not, you can literally throw Pascal's wager out and not think about that at all, but like, this just can't be right. So I think that's really important. You're not just modifying the math to make the wager work. You're modifying the math because something's going wrong here. Um, and, and again, you're not even really modifying decision theory. You're just changing the way we think about infinities in decision theory. And I think that's an important point too. You don't have to totally throw out the way we think about decision theory multiplying probabilities times utilities. You just have to say, when we do that multiplication, it's not, the probability isn't absorbed. So um, that was the first thing I wanted to say. What was it? What was the second thing you said? Um, Finite but arbitrarily so large. Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> yes. So this is Mike Rhoda's way of of going with the wager and how he gets around both these objections. And it is a great way to go get around both these objections. And I'm just going to say the the one downside of going the finite but arbitrarily large way. Um, the one downside of that is you're not going to have the result that you should wager for the religion you take to be most likely to be true. You're gonna have the result that you should wager for the religion you take to be most likely to be true if it meets some threshold of probability. And that threshold of probability is gonna be determined by what the finite values that you put into the wager are. Yeah, because if like Christianity so. is like, um, 
let's say, okay, we're just going to make up these values. Suppose these are high. Like if Christianity is 50 and Islam is 100, um, th that's, a, that's what your assessment with respect to the, the expected value of believing in these things. Well, then even if Christianity is more probable, say like 50, you give like a, uh, like a 45% credence to that, and then Islam, you get like a 40% credence. You run the numbers, and Islam is actually going to win out on that one, even though you don't think it's the most probable. You think Christianity is most probable. So that, like you said, that is a downside. Right. So it's it's just a it's a slightly less I guess powerful or controversial argument. I still think it's super controversial. But like Mike Rota says, you your probability for the religion has to be at least 0.5. That's kind of his threshold. Um, there, you could you you could have a lower threshold, but it would all just be determined by what the finite values that you you use are. The bigger the finite values, the lower that threshold has to be. But you're going to have to meet the threshold. If you use infinite values, you don't actually have to meet a threshold. You just have to say. Uh, you just wager on the religion you take to be most likely to be true, no matter how improbable that is. Sweet. Okay, so th th that's good. I think we can now go on to the objection from doxastic voluntarism. So um, another common objection that, that you see uh, both in the literature and online is that Pascal's wager presupposes something called doxastic voluntarism, uh, according to which we kind of have the power to choose what we believe. That is, uh, doxastic voluntarism says that our beliefs, like doxa, right, that's what belief, that's what doxa means, um, beliefs are within our voluntary voluntarism, are within our voluntary control. But, so the objection goes, doxastic voluntarism is either unmotivated or worse, obviously false, right? So like, if I try to believe that like, I don't know, like Graham Oppie doesn't exist or something like I can't I can't do that. Like I can try as hard as I want, but I'm not going to be able to convince myself that Graham Oppie doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, how do you respond to this kind of uh, objection from doxastic voluntarism? OK, so I have three responses, but I'm going to try to not, I'm going to try to make them quick. Um, so here's my first response, and this is maybe the most controversial. So. The fact that doxastic voluntarism is, uh, sorry, let's say doxastic involuntarism seems true in certain cases. So it seems like in certain cases we can't control our beliefs. If you give me $1,000 to believe one plus one equals three or that Grandma doesn't exist or whatever, I can't do it. So just because it's true about certain beliefs doesn't mean we don't have control over all of our beliefs. And what's interesting is when people motivate doxastic voluntarism, they often start with cases of beliefs Doxastic involuntarism, I don't know if I said that, sorry, uh, that we can't control our beliefs, cannot. Uh, they start with cases of beliefs that are either really obviously true or really obviously false, right? So it's super hard to control uh, your belief that one plus one equals two to not believe that or your, belief, your disbelief that one plus one equals three to start believing that or even maybe withhold belief on that. It's pretty difficult, right? Um, but I think what's kind of interesting and what's, what's cool about this point is it actually is a point that a bunch of epistemologists have been making recently in a totally separate literature that's not connected to Pascal's wager. And I actually have a paper that's under R and R right now, so fingers crossed, uh, where I try to relate this literature to Pascal's wager. But the thought is that if we're dealing with some proposition or some belief that it's not, if you're like, you're really torn about it, you're really struggling, you're sort of going back and forth, you can think about it kind of like the duck rabbit picture, if you've seen that, how you can kind of go back and forth and see it both ways. And Peter Van Inwagen has this really interesting autobiography where he's like, I could see the world as created in one moment and then not created in the other moment. And I could actually kind of move back and forth at will. Um, and I think it's really interesting to think about cases like that instead of cases like one plus one equals three, because I think in those cases, it's a lot less obvious that you don't have at least some level of control. Um, it's not saying it's the same control that you have as like, you know, I'll give you $10 if you raise your hand and you raise your hand. But that's also not the only relevant level of control. Like, you could say, I'll give you $100 if you rearrange my bedroom furniture. And I can't do that, like, in the same way I can just, like, raise my hand. Like, it's not a basic action in the sense that it's just this immediate, uninterrupted act. It would take me some time, maybe some planning, um, depending on, like, how complicated <laughs> moving everything around would be or whatever. Um, or, like, writing a paper. Like, that's like a long drawn out process, but I still have like some level of control over that. And in fact, could do that in response to money or, you know, um, to some practical reason. It's just this, this process rather than this thing I can do immediately. So that's the first response that doxastic voluntarism being true in some cases doesn't mean it's true in all cases. <clears throat> and we need to think about these propositions that you're torn about. Those are, I think, going to be the, the interesting ones. Um, 
I guess response two is actually kind of related to that. And the thought is that even if we don't have any kind of level of direct control over our beliefs, it still seems like there's some, there are things that we can control indirectly by like who, like who we read or who we hang out with or, um, you know, what we spend our time, like evidence gathering, like, you know, that kind of thing. And what so, YouTube videos you watch, well, like Majesty yeah. of Reason, obviously. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, you're just watching the wrong YouTube channels, apparently. Um, go click on the other one. But, <laughs> but yeah, you could think about it like, you know, the control you might have over losing weight or getting in shape or, you know, these like long term projects, like being someone who wakes up earlier, you're not going to just do it immediately. But if you kind of set it as a goal to do it over time, um, it seems like you can, you can do it. Uh, potentially, you at least, you know, there's a decent probability you can if you really set your mind to it. So um, doxastic voluntarism, I think, doesn't uh, like people that say doxastic voluntarism is false almost all philosophers say, but we still have some level of control over our beliefs. It's just this long-term, long-range control. Um, okay, so maybe I'll just clarify. I, th I take objection, or response one, to be saying, maybe we do actually have some level of even more direct control over our beliefs in cases when we're torn about matters. Response two is saying, even if we don't have that, maybe we have this long-range control over our beliefs. So that's, I think, how those responses are potentially distinct. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, response three um, is actually, so this is the way, again, that Mike Rota goes and some others, they say, just, just get rid of belief, talk at all, like, just stop thinking about Pascal's wager in terms of what you should believe, and you could even say, that's a question for, for epistemology, decision theory is a separate thing, decision theory is about practical rationality, remember we said it's means and rationality, and so the wager on, on this view is about a commitment to God. It's about seeking a relationship with God. Um, maybe it's an argument that we should, you know, go to church and pray and read religious texts, immerse ourselves in a religious community, that kind of thing. So if you make the wager, say just don't think about beliefs at all, make it about this kind of commitment to God, then I think that that pretty much sidesteps the, the objection altogether. But I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket either. I think there's something interesting to be said for the first two responses as well. Sweet. So yeah, we had the, the first one, which is like, okay, uh, we do seem to have at least something like direct control, or at least it's not at all obvious that we don't have uh, direct control when we're super duper torn and you, you know, pointed to Van and Wagon. Um, uh, and then also in the sec in the second response you gave, you know, um, well, we have like indirect kind of long term control, such as, you know, blood pressure, things like that. And then the, the third response you gave was like, well, hold on, like jettison belief. Let's just talk about action. So um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, are there any other like responses in the literature that are worth like uh, highlighting here that maybe you don't find plausible or um, do some people just like, well, no, go, I'll, I'll turn it over to you before we go on to the next objection. Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of people would actually say me keeping it about belief isn't plausible. Um, but what's like kind of interesting when you read like the Pascal's wager literature, I'm thinking of like Jeff Jordan is, is one person here. They just sort of say like doxastic voluntarism is false. It's just clearly false. So we got to move to action or something, you know? So I actually think of anything, I'm the one that people would say that response is implausible. But I think what we need to do is step back and then think a little bit more about doxastic voluntarism and read that literature and see the reasons that people accept or reject it. And I mean, actually like completely removed from my even like working on Pascal's wager, I became convinced in grad school that this is this is a philosopher's dogma that is not very well motivated. <laughs> um, so I, that and I mean, you can say you're biased, blah, blah, blah. But I really promise, like I took this class on dissaxic voluntarism and like everyone in the class, like theists, atheists, all of us were like, how are like all these philosophers just so against doxastic voluntarism? Um, like, it's just not like, yes, like you can't control your belief that one plus one equals two. But like, that is not the thesis. The thesis is like whether we can control any of our beliefs, you know? So I think they just put a ton of weight on these really specific examples and then just like way over generalize. So if you talk to anyone that did their PhD at Notre Dame from like, 2009 to 2014 they're probably just gonna like hate doxastic volunteers so there's <laughs> so a fun fact for you <laughs> among those that might okay so that might include ryan mullins maybe uh, 
might be Dustin Crum. It, it might be Josh Rasmussen, although he might be earlier. Um, but I'll have to ask them. <laughs> yeah, and actually, so I'm trying to think. Dust. See, Dustin was around when we were taking that class, but I don't think he was in that class. Um, but I feel like Dustin's pretty reasonable. I feel like Dustin would see the light on this. Um, but this was before Josh was there, unfortunately. But but uh, Josh is reasonable too, so he might see the light too. But anyway, <laughs> I actually have an entire paper where I like talk about all this in more detail. So hopefully if that comes out, um, it's called Epistemic Permissivism in Pascal's Wager. So fingers crossed. <laughs> nice. Okay, so let's move on to the next objection. So this one, uh, I'm just going to call it evidence sensitivity and pragmatic sensitivity. It's nothing fancy. I'll explain those in a second. Um, and it's kind of like an, it's been like an inchoate objection of mine. Um, one which I find like just, it's difficult to spell out in words, you know, but alas, I'll try. So Essentially, I feel as though, I can only speak personally, I feel as though I'm just dispositionally unable to believe and act with respect to significant philosophical questions like God's existence or you know, like the nature of causation or time, um, according to practical or pragmatic reasons when my evidence base tells against such beliefs or actions or what have you. For example, by telling in favor of agnosticism due to significant pieces of evidence on both sides. And perhaps this is just like a, a prejudice or a bias or, or something, but it's almost like I have this, I don't know, it's just this massive resistance to pragmatic leaps, uh, either of belief or of action or what have you, when they stand at odds with my epistemic and my, my sort of reason-based considerations. And so I almost feel like a compulsion to act in accordance uh, with the majesty of reason, you know, and, and to what my um, and to what my sort of epistemic deliverances kind of tell me. And so... I guess my worry for the wager, or one worry that I have that's hard to spell out that I'm doing right now, is, is just this. We can think of our kind of behavioral and doxastic dispositions in many ways, but one way is kind of along a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, there's evidence sensitivity, and on the other end of the spectrum, there's pragmatic sensitivity. And I don't really have like ready-made definitions here, but the closer one falls towards the evidence sensitivity side, the much more emphasis and importance and significance one places on the kind of epistemic reasons for belief and action, and the much less one places on the pragmatic reasons for belief and action. And the contrary, of course, is true for those who fall uh, towards the pragmatic sensitivity side. And so I guess my worry for Pascal's wager is that, that it just seems to presuppose a collection of habits and dispositions, both behavioral and doxastic, that are at least not significantly slanted toward the evidence sensitivity side of the spectrum. But I guess that's like precisely where I find myself, you know, like it's precisely where all of my habits and dispositions and beliefs, my very core lies. Um, and it just seems that um, Pascal's wager is impotent. Uh, it just seems, again, I'm not like claiming that it's this decisively refuted or anything, but it just seems Pascal's wager is, is close to impotent for people who fall at least significantly on this side of the spectrum. And I just feel like, the wager itself doesn't give such people uh, like a very powerful reason to abandon their location on the spectrum uh, and to kind of shift maybe more towards the middle or towards the pragmatic sensitivity side. And so uh, for the audience, I'm not saying that Pascal's wager amounts to ignoring evidence or being irrational or whatever. Um, the objection is about a given individual's collection of values and habits and, and behavioral and doxastic dispositions that may, if the collection falls significantly on the evidentialist side or evidence sensitive side, render Pascal's wager um, not sufficiently strong for them. So that's a bit of a mouthful but uh, hopefully that was a uh, hopefully you get what I'm saying so I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on this type of objection yeah definitely so actually if it's okay I want to talk about um, the action thing first and then talk about the doxastic beliefs okay so when it comes to action so this would be like the commitment based versions of Pascal's wager Pascal's wager gives us reason to act in certain ways um, I guess I think that most of us are epistemically and pragmatically sensitive, but we're very pragmatically sensitive. And I can give you a couple examples to illustrate like why I think that. Um, and I think that the general reason I think that is because we will act on something that has a low probability, but because of the risk reward trade-off, um, we'll act on low probability things um, all the time. Like it's, uh, I think, a, a common, I mean, maybe not all the time, but it's, it's a very intuitive phenomenon. So like one case that I've given before in the past is like, um, like let's say your, your brother is like your best friend and you guys are super close, super tight, and he, he goes missing. 
and maybe a couple weeks pass and the probability that he's he's dead or he's he's gone forever it just keeps getting higher and higher and higher so there's like less and less of a chance that you're gonna find him um i still think it could be totally rational to act kind of against that evidence act as if your brother's alive and just continue to search for him and seek for him at least for a long time. I mean, maybe at a certain point people will say he just needs to give up if it's like five years later or something, but it's still going to be this point where there's a pretty low probability your brother's alive, but you should still seek him. You should still try to find him because of the risk reward trade-off. Um, I mean, that's a more serious example, but like more trivial examples would be like the car insurance case or like things that people do when they're gambling like all the time, you know, it's like, this is super low probability, but I'm going to act as if it's true because of this risk reward trade-off. So I think, um, I guess I find this more compelling as like the, the doxastic one than, than the action-based one, because I do think when we act where we are really sensitive to risk reward trade-offs and um, we'll act as if something's true, even if it has a low probability. So I wanted to say, that I, I, I think this objection isn't going to be at least super devastating for the commitment version of Pascal's wager. But I think it's it's really interesting to think about this objection for the doxastic one. So I want to say a little bit about that, but I think that one is, is challenging. Um, so the main response that I think would be the most plausible when it comes to belief, like, and, and, and what the objection would be, tell me if I'm wrong, would be something like, um, my beliefs are just on the spectrum or whatever. My beliefs are just evidence sensitive. And I just, I can't believe things for a practical reason. I just can't, I can't do that. That's not, you know, it's just not how I'm wired. I'm, I'm believing things based on, I'm letting the evidence be the thing that pushes my beliefs around. Um, yeah, or at least so strong, for, you know, yeah, like, I, I yeah. think, I think the psychological literature teaches us that, you know, obviously there are like countless different factors that influence our beliefs, you know, even our desires and other sorts of things. But um, at least certain forms of training makes us more sensitive uh, than we might otherwise have been. Um, and at least, you know, at least striving, striving, at least having a dispositional striving for that kind of um, evidence sensitivity. Um, yeah. So I just want I just wanted to make uh, give that caveat because uh, some people, you know, I do think it is a myth that some people can like just be, you know, completely responsive to the evidence and have this cold calculation. I think that's a total myth. And we know that from the psychological evidence. I'm not attributing that to you, by the way. <laughs> so so the, just for the audience. <laughs> uh, yeah. Totally. I, and honestly, this is like before I jump to answering it, like the objection, like this is a, a, a huge problem I have with a lot of like they're just thinking about these like perfect cases of belief where it's like ability point nine credence. Oh, and it's just like, come on, like that is not how it happens. Like I believe my team is going to win because I freaking want them to like against the evidence. And, you know, maybe that's irrational. Maybe I shouldn't be like bragging about this, but people do this stuff all the time. And you see it, especially like you just have to think about like emotionally charged cases. And like then we're just these cases just like multiply of wishful thinking and believing without evidence and all that. So I, I totally agree with you. And I acknowledge like people do that. But I think Pascal's wager is about what we should do. It's not just about what we do do. And if Pascal's wager is an instance of wishful thinking, like that seems like a problem too, you know? Um, so we don't want to say like, well, we do this one wishful thinking. So like <laughs> Pascal's wager is kosher, you know? So so here's my second response, but this is um, actually related to that paper I was talking about too and something, uh, it's kind of this idea that I'm throwing around. And so here's the thought. And not not everyone's gonna agree with this, so there's this is controversial among epistemologists, but I think it would be really, really interesting if there were cases of what you might call epistemic ties. So cases where, given your evidence, you could, for example, be rational as a theist, rational as an agnostic, or rational as an atheist. Um, you might also call this epistemic underdetermination, where your evidence underdetermines what how you how you ought to respond. And you know, like cases again, like one plus one equals two, will clearly not be these kinds of cases. Your evidence clearly points to you should believe one plus one equals two. But it's interesting to think about the possibility that theism might be a case where our evidence is sort of underdetermined. And um, at least for some of us, I mean, maybe there's people that have had like super vivid experiences of God, or on the other hand, people that just think like, there's no way God could exist in my evidence like proves that like, maybe there is some people like that. But some of us might be in a case where our evidence really does kind of underdetermine what we should believe. And they're like, like two or three of those belief attitudes are kind of epistemically tied for us. And so 
I think it's interesting to think about the possibility, at least, that instead of saying I'm either epistemic sensitive or pragmatic sensitive, what the pragmatic is doing is it all it's doing is it's being a tiebreaker when the epistemic is underdetermined. So my evidence lets me, let's just say, for example, be a theist or be an agnostic. Either one is perfectly rational. Um, but the pragmatic can then kind of come in and, and break that tie. And it's not obvious to me that that would be epistemically irrational because we actually sort of set up the case by saying either of those is rational given your evidence. The pragmatic is just kind of breaking this epistemic tie. So I think that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it because it's not just like the epistemic and the pragmatic are at odds. They're not giving you different prescriptions. The epistemic is permissive and then the pragmatic, you know, says, okay, then you should go this way. So I just kind of played around with some some philosophical ideas and I'm not saying everyone's in that situation, but I think it would be kind of interesting if some people were. Yeah. Hmm. So there are different ways that I would like I'd like to take that. So one of them is like in, in cases of underdetermination, right? I mean, we can we can pull apart we can pull apart a case of underdetermination where someone just simply doesn't have adequate evidence on either side such that, you know, maybe it's like roughly half and half counterbalanced. So in that case, it's almost like um, more of a negative kind of agnosticism, where the, the, the agnosticism is motivated by one's not having a particular reason to favor one side or the other. So that's a kind of negative agnosticism that, that we can, or a kind of negative agnostic epistemic underdetermination that we can uh, distinguish. But then on the, other, on the other hand, there seems to be a kind of positive epistemic uh, positive agnostic epistemic underdetermination, where someone seems to have lots and lots of pieces on this side and lots and lots of pieces of evidence on this side. And in, in that case, they also form a conclusion according to which the sides are roughly counterbalanced, just like the negative agnostic. Uh, but in this case, the positive agnostic has has like substantial pieces of evidence on both sides. And I don't know, it's like, it's unclear to me that that second kind of agnostic, the positive agnostic, I don't know, it's just unclear that they like should or 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 have to, or I don't know, like that they should take this kind of pragmatic route. Because after all, if they do take it, well then they do indeed have that substantive evidence against them going that practical route. And so it's almost like it's pulling them back or, or so. I don't know. It, it again, this is kind of I'm not articulating this in the best way, but I'm I'm wondering if if that kind of distinction between uh, negative and positive agnosticism can come in here and perhaps be a response to what you say with respect to epistemic underdetermination. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so first of all, I think that's a really important and just useful distinction in general. Some people, um, although I don't think there's a, a consensus on this yet, but they'll call, if I, if I get, I might get this wrong, but I think the negative agnostic, they say that's withholding, and then the positive agnostic is agnostic. I think that's how they do it. But I do think there's an there's is a really important distinction between I have never thought about this question before. I guess I'll withhold belief. And then I have weighed the evidence for days and years and hours and whatever and thought about this a ton. And I, I think the rational position is withholding belief. You know, I think I think there's a, a very important distinction between both of those. And, you know, when you hear about like a new philosophical problem or puzzle and you're just like, oh, dude, I don't know. You're more of like. You're, you're like withholding belief. But then if you thought through something and really read articles and looked at the evidence, um, and, and it doesn't always require that. Like that I have an even number of hairs on my head. I think I'm like a positive agnostic about that just because of the nature of my evidence. I just, you know, I just, given my evidence, I'm positive that is the rational position, you know? Um, so it doesn't always require this study, but it's almost like this positive stance that you're taking versus just like, a, I don't know, you know? So the first thing to say is I think that's a really good distinction. I think the second thing to say, one thing that I'm really interested in is the possibility that your evidence could actually, it wouldn't even necessarily um, be balanced between all three belief attitudes, but it might just be balanced between like two belief attitudes. So I think there's some really like interesting cases of this, of where your evidence like for a proposition like slowly trickles in. So you could think about a case where um, I'm driving down the highway, I see this super blurry sign really far away. 
I withhold belief or I'm agnostic, I guess, <laughs> whatever, you know, about what the sign says. And then as I like, maybe I'm just driving really slowly for what my, my grandma's driving. We'll say that um, <laughs> driving really slow. So I slowly get more evidence about what that sign is. And at a certain point, the thought is um, believing that the sign says exit 58 or whatever and withholding are both sort of permissible um given my my epistemic situation you could also think about like an r chart i think those are kind of interesting too like you can clearly see the e at the top and then like most of us can't see the bottom unless we have like superman's eyesight or whatever um and somewhere on that i chart there's potentially a line where belief and withholding belief could be rational for you so, so I guess the, the downside of going this way is that it limits the applicability of this response. But I do think it's really interesting if you're sort of torn between, for example, belief and agnosticism, th then, then the practical could maybe be a tiebreaker there. Um, but I do think, it, I mean, it's trickier to spell out. You might say, if I'm really in this case where belief withholding and disbelief are all potentially rational for me, that really is just gonna collapse into, I should withhold belief. And I, I think that debate is gonna to have to happen on the level of the epistemology. We're gonna to have to say, is this kind of permissivism possible or not? Um, and then whether that's possible, I think it could apply to Pascal's wager. But if it's if it's not, if those are cases where it's just gonna collapse into a non-permissive case, then I think it's not gonna apply in the same way. So so we're gonna we're gonna need to have this debate about whether you could have a true permissive Permissivism, where all three attitudes, three attitudes really truly all are permitted. Um, that that's I think where the action lies with respect to like kind of our back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting, and it, you know, it, it's always fun when you know you're looking at a particular argument or you know this very nuanced argument in this one area of philosophy, but then like. In order to settle that argument, you have to like bring in all these other sorts of things, which is good. You know, it's interesting. You have to like, you know, now we're talking about epistemic permissivism and uh, your stance on that is going to affect uh, certain objections to Pascal's wager and other sorts of things. It's just really interesting how some philosophical uh, arguments and contexts are so are such as to, you know, I don't know, be interlocking with so many different webs. And it, I just really like that. It's just a meta point. Um, I guess one final thing before we go on to uh, the next objection. Uh, is I'm wondering, I'm wondering how this kind of epistemic under underdetermination that you speak of, I wonder, because you know there are different ways that you can have the underdetermination. Like one way is to have the evidence being counterbalanced um, with the the case of like the like the positive agnostic that we were talking about. I'll just use those phrases just because um, the positive agnostic where they have good evidence on both sides. Um, that's one case of having this underdetermination. Another case of having this underdetermination is the negative agnostic where it's just like, I don't know, <laughs> you don't really have evidence on either way. But I guess a third case might be when your evidence is almost like incommensurable, you know, like so incommensurability is like when you don't even have a common or like standard metric by which you can compare them. Um, and so in that case, it's like you don't even know, like you know that you have evidence on both sides, but it's like maybe maybe there are different sorts of evidence, completely different kinds. And so like they're not even comparable. And in that case, it seems like it's much less clear that, that you should. Um, so I guess I guess another response that I'm just trying to level here towards what you're saying is like, what if we appeal to evidence incommensurability, where it's just like not even clear that you should pragmatically go one way or the other just because it's just like you don't even have a standard by which like to tell w whether or not you should fall on the theist side or the atheist side or what have you. Like maybe you had a religious experience, but maybe you also have read a lot of the problem of evil literature. And I don't know. Um, what do you think about this? Maybe, maybe you can help me. <laughs> You're the expert here. Yeah. No, no, I think that's interesting. I was actually thinking about that case too, like religious experience versus like a deductive argument. Like maybe those would be in, I don't know. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, I guess I was kind of thinking that this sort of incommensurability might actually potentially work in my favor because it's like, if you're in a situation where your evidence really is just incommensurable and like can't be weighed against each other, then like, can we really fault you for picking one attitude rather than another, like you're in just this really tough case. I mean, and you could think about it maybe similarly to cases where your evidence is just super complicated and confusing. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but 
your response to that evidence might be similar. Like if you can't weigh your evidence against each other or if your evidence is like super complicated, it seems like those might potentially be cases where it is per- it's rationally permissible for you to hold more than one attitude. So I don't, that's probably not what you were intending, but I was thinking maybe I could like turn, turn this on its head and like actually use this as a potential motivation for permissivism. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, it'd be interesting to explore how incommensurability of evidence um, relates to epistemic permissivism, but anyway, uh, that's a be yeah. <laughs> that's in epistemology and epistemology is like a little bit beyond my pay grade. I'll just, <laughs> I'll stick to metaphysics and philosophy of religion. But um, <laughs> so uh, is it okay if you, if it's okay with you, can we go on to like the, the next objection? Is that cool? Oh, totally, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So the next objection that we're going to consider is what I've just called uh, the gratuity of Pascal's wager. Um, so um, uh, another worry that, that I've kind of had for the wager runs as follows. So at least in my view, it just seems, it seems to me that any perfect being worthy of the name wouldn't punish someone who honestly pursues the truth with all their might and strives to cultivate deep and profound and, and long-lasting intellectual and moral virtue and, and follows reason and justification wherever they lead. Consider, for instance, the you know, admittedly romanticized story of Socrates, the martyr for truth, right? Socrates was put to death for corrupting the youth. That is, questioning them and engaging in philosophical discussion with them in the pursuit of truth. Socrates faced his death with valor and courage and nobility. Uh, He was unjustly martyred for his love of truth, we can say. Um, And so supposing that Socrates, by the time of his death, cultivated an intellectually and morally virtuous character, and we can suppose rejected wrongdoing and vice and was perhaps in some sense repentant of his wrongdoing in his life, it strikes me as monstrously implausible that he would be tortured eternally merely for not, you know, believing the right set of doctrinal claims or not attending or performing religious rituals or, or and whatnot. And so to me, it seems that any perfect being wouldn't punish such an examined life, such a virtuous life. Um, but such a life is like intrinsically, it's already intrinsically valuable and ought to be pursued for that reason. And and that seems true regardless of any religious affirmations of faith and regardless of attending church services or things like that. And so it seems, in other words, that the intrinsic value of moral and intellectual virtue and, and truth-seeking screens off, as it were, the Pascalian pragmatic case for religious acts and beliefs. I mean, given the nature of a perfect being and given the nature of intellectual and moral virtue, it seems like Pascal's wager is gratuitous from what I've been kind of saying and arguing. Like we already should be cultivating these intellectual and moral virtues due to their intrinsic value, regardless of religious practices. And the nature of a perfect being is plausibly such that those who excel in such a pursuit of those moral and intellectual virtues and so on wouldn't be punished. And and so that's all a bit, you know, imprecisely stated, but um, hopefully you're seeing what I'm getting at. I mean, it just seems that pragmatic reasoning for religious acts and beliefs is kind of screened off in some sense by what constitutes a virtuous life or a good life. And the fact that a perfect being wouldn't punish such a virtuous life or good life, regardless of whether that life includes things like attending church church services. So long, so long as, of course, the person isn't like suppressing their knowledge of the truth, you know, like, or things like that. Um, And I I guess one final thing before I turn it over to you, Um, I got his permission for this, but um, Zach Reimer made an interesting comment from Facebook uh, where he kind of put this above worry, uh, or perhaps maybe a slightly related worry, more clearly and poetically than I can. So I'm just going to read what what he said. So he says, "Um, consider what we might call heroic non-believers. God, if God exists, has given them a <laughs> timorous, <and> timorous. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stupid when it comes to words. Has given them has given them a courageous and virtuous nature and spirit of evidentialism. They would rather they would rather things go worse for them than to not match their belief to the evidence. You might end in hell, says a wise though gambling addicted friend. <laughs> though uh, though following the evidence may slay me, still will I follow the evidence, says the doubting Thomas. I'd consider these suffering loving fellows my guides and exemplars. If there is a God, someone who chooses to appeal to evidence in doubting seems just as admirable as someone who appeals to eternal rewards in believing or accepting. It is not clear which is greater. Further, if God is perfect, matching one's doubt to the ambiguity of the evidence seems like a saving act, a faith so deep that it trusts the ultimate to reveal itself through doubt. It seems like the very ambiguity of the evidence and plurality of values makes it more likely that betting on skepticism is saving, or at least would be a good bet on a perfectly loving God. Okay, so with that read, 
maybe you could take us through, I know it's a lot, so sorry about that, but maybe you could take us through the kind of objection that I'm raising and Zach Reimer is, is raising here as well. Yeah, definitely. So that's super, super interesting. I think it's a really, it's a good objection. It's, and I think there's actually sort of maybe two objections. Like one is more about um, whether Pascal's wager is, what was the word you used? Um, oh, gratuitous. gratuitous. Yeah, gratuitous. <laughs> And then the other is like, wouldn't God reward people for just following the truth, whether that is believing in God or not, you know? So um, I have thoughts on both. I guess one interesting thing about the gratuitous point, and this isn't a full response, but I think it's just interesting to note is like, it would be sort of cool if like we had moral and epistemic reasons to like be intellectually virtuous and do all this stuff. And then Pascal's wager is like, and you also have like prudential pragmatic means and reasons. Like that would be kind of interesting. And maybe those means and ends reasons could motivate you in cases where you were just feeling like weak willed or like not all about the truth one day or whatever. So I think that's, that's like just an interesting little thought that I was kind of thinking about as you were reading, like it that's gives a you a response. kind of reason. Sorry, reason, no, I know. So. I just want to interrupt. Yeah. I like, that's a good response because it shows that like, even if this objection kind of works in screening off Pascal's wager as it were, like it's, it, that doesn't make Pascal's wager uh, irrelevant. It doesn't make it not valuable, right? It, it, it still retains its value because it, it kind of adds on to this case. It gives you further reason to pursue the good life, right? So uh, that's a really good point. I like that. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, and, and it's not just um, about the normative reasons either. It's about motivating reasons, I think, as well. Like, uh, when we're... Like, like this comes back to the very thing we we're saying beginning with decision theory. Like, it's how to be rational given your beliefs and your desires, right? So if you have this, like, means and reason to do it, I think that will give you an additional, like, motivating reason, um, if not also, like, a normative reason of the practical flavor. So, so that's kind of... That's a potential thing, uh, at least a potential thing to think about. Um, I guess a couple other responses. I like, I, I'm super interested in this, so I like wrote out all this stuff and now I'm like, should I talk about all of this? But um, here's like a really, okay. So one thing that I'm really interested in is different kinds of oughts and the way that different kinds of oughts play against each other. So arguably there's like epistemic oughts that have to do with like what we should believe, like maybe following our evidence or striving to know things or whatever, going for the truth. Um, there's moral oughts and then we can debate about whether we're like consequentialists or Kantians or, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's practical oughts and maybe there's other oughts too, like aesthetic oughts or something, right? So one like really interesting question question and I don't want to take an, a, a, a total stance on this necessarily here but I think it's just like philosophically interesting to think about um, is whether these like epistemic truth-loving oughts trump other oughts or maybe at least trump the prudential oughts even if they maybe don't trump moral oughts I mean I don't know it's interesting to think about what role these epistemic oughts would play when we're trying to decide like well what should we do in general like what should we do considering the epistemic and the moral and the prudential like what do we do when these oughts play play against each other, for example? Let me give an example to make this more concrete. I feel like I'm being very abstract right now. Um, so here's a case that I think is interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's say, <laughs> again, philosophers with their super crazy dumb cases, but the mafia kidnaps your family. And this is a truth-hating mafia. It's very sad. Um, so they kidnap your family. And they are going to return your family safely if you take a pill that gives you like a false, a guaranteed false belief about the 275th digit of pi. <laughs> uh, but for some reason you just know, like they hate the truth and they just want you to have this false belief. So if you take this pill, uh, your family will be returned to you. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that all things considered, you should take the pill. And this is so and this is why I'm hesitant, because if that's right, what this sort of suggests is that the truth loving oughts aren't always the ultimate oughts. You know, um, there might be cases where moral oughts actually trump these truth loving oughts. Um, it seems like the lives of your family are more important than one false belief about something irrelevant. Um, and then, I mean, we can we can modify the case and try to think about like how far do we take this if we're even on board with this? Cause it is kind of sad to say like the truth isn't the ultimate thing. Like what, like, are you like not a philosopher? Like how could you say that? But it's like, but we should follow the evidence where it leads, I guess. And maybe it is true that the truth isn't the ultimate thing. I don't know. So, but like, we could think about a case where it's like your most precious life project. And it's more of this practical thing. 
um, where this is just like what you've been working at your whole life. And then the mafia, it's like this statue, let's say you've been building for 25 years, uh, the David statue or something. And then the mafia takes that and then you have to take this false belief pill. It's like, uh, maybe that's a case where the epistemic ought, <laughs> like the, the prudential ought trumps the epistemic one, maybe. Um, so it's interesting to think about like, like being a truth lover is great. I'm not saying we shouldn't be, but it's interesting to think about if there's ever cases where something is just more weighty than having a true belief. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I think it's at least relevant because I, because I think part of what was behind the question was almost this assumption that loving the truth would be like some ultimate end. And I guess the the response is like, I like that and that's really beautiful, but I don't know if that's obviously true. Um, mm-hmm. So. So that's a potential response. Um, I also think as a, a sort of second response, uh, bringing the permissivism again in again could be interesting as well. Like if you think about this truth lover and they just, they want the truth, um, but they're kind of in this place where their evidence is ambiguous and it's not obvious that it would be irrational for them to be a theist, for example, then I think it's it's not obvious that becoming a theist is going to be inconsistent with their goal of loving truth. And while they, like, once they become a theist, you know, they can continue to gather evidence, they can continue to search, to search for the truth. But if their evidence doesn't force them to be maybe an agnostic or an atheist, then I guess I, I think you could be a truth lover and still take Pascal's wager. So I think permissivism could, could do some interesting work here as well. Um, Maybe I'll just talk about two more responses really quick. But yeah, again, I don't think I don't think I'm giving a full response this either because I think it's a really interesting objection. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess two more things. Um, just about what we need for Pascal's wager to go through. So I think Pascal's wager is actually consistent with there being a high probability that truth lovers go to heaven. Um, the 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 real crux of the question is: um, Are those who kind of seek God or commit to God or do whatever we frame the wager in terms of more likely to go to heaven than the truth lover, you know? So we could say there's still this very, very high probability that truth lovers go to heaven. But if you commit to God or seek God, uh, you know, if that's, if that like even boosts your probability a tiny bit, we can debate about that. But I'm just saying that's what the wager would hang on. So the wager is consistent with there being um, this high probability that truth lovers go to heaven. And then that's also interesting to combine that response with the potential previous idea I mentioned, which maybe you could take the wager and still be a truth lover. So mm-hmm. um, that's interesting. And then I guess the final thing, and and you sort of mentioned this when yeah, you were talking about psychological literature. Well, mm-hmm. well, yeah. And just like, I think it's, it's, it's easy to, to see ourselves as truth lovers and to say, I really do love the truth. But then once your favorite team is playing in the national championship, you sort of forget about that truth loving self. I mean, I don't know, maybe I just get, I get really up in arms about sports, but everyone has their little area that they, you know, they start forgetting about they're supposed to be a truth lover. And so I think it is at least worth really stepping back and thinking like, and like, am I being influenced by my bias here? Am I really looking at this evidence with an, with an open mind? And I'm not saying you're not, but I do think it, this could be a case where it is potentially um, easy to be self-deceived. And so one thing that I think Pascal's wager just points out is like, look, the stakes are really, really high with respect to theism. And so we need to really make sure we're like looking at this evidence clearly, not suppressing the truth. Um, and I think Pascal's wager makes questions about theism like way more important than a lot of other questions, even other like philosophical questions and maybe all questions. I mean, maybe not all questions, but Mm -hmm. a lot of questions in a lot of domains. And so I think that's interesting too, is just like, we really like Pascal's wager, really, like we really got to like do our, do our duties when it comes to God's existence. And that's, I mean, that's a much more mild version of the wager. It's not really, it's just saying like, look at that evidence hard, you know, but I still think we can think we're looking at the evidence hard when we're actually not. And it's good to be aware of that too. Yeah. And that, that also bleeds into, to, one of the first responses that, that you said, you know, where, you know, this is kind of, it's almost providing more motivation to cultivate these intellectual virtues, and it's sort of undergirded by practical rationality. So that that's interesting. And so once again, we can say that even if the objection succeeds in some sense, there's also a sense in which, uh, and I'm not attributing to you that claim that it does indeed succeed, but I'm just saying, like, even if, you know, someone is convinced by this kind of objection, um, they might still, they might still find great value in the wager. 
right? And so we, you know, we've kind of pinpointed some reasons for thinking that that is the case. Okay, so I know we are nearing the end. Um, maybe if you're okay with this, maybe we could do a five minute speed round for the last two objections, uh, and then we won't be able to get to the bonus section on um, credence and belief. Uh, but with res we'll just do a five minute bonus round and then we'll close this out, uh, if that's okay with you. Sorry, I, I feel like I've been really long-winded. I'm normally not. No, no, it's no. <laughs> Do not say sorry. Thank you. I love these. I mean, these are great questions. And I think that just speaks to the quality of, of the philosophical material that you have presented. So, oh, awesome. thank you so much. It, it, means, <laughs> yeah. it, means, it means everything. So, um, but we'll, we'll do a speed round. So um, the next two objections are universalism and Pascal's mugger, mugger. So I'll do the speed round with universalism. How does universalism interact with Pascal's wager and does it undergird an objection to the wager? <laughs> Yeah, great question. So <clears throat> basically, um, I think it's really important to clarify this because I think when you see Pascal's wager, you assume like obviously you have to believe in hell to take Pascal's wager, like that negative infinity thing is there. Um, but that's actually not true at, at all. Um, and I think the traditional wager, my wager, most versions of the wager um, are consistent with um, believing universalism and thinking universalism has a very high probability um, and they can get off the ground as long as there's some small possibility of hell. Um, so I think that's worth worth noting. And also, too, they can get off the ground if you just have like heaven and annihilationism. So you could actually take hell out of the picture completely and say, like, there's heaven and annihilationism and that's it. Um, Thirdly, they can, it can also get off the ground if you think everyone goes to heaven with 100% certainty. And here's how. Um, if you think there are different levels of heaven, so maybe one person gets like 10 noodles per day, per day and one person gets like 20 noodles per day, um, and then you think maybe theists are more likely to get higher noodles than atheists, uh, you could actually get a version of the wager going that is consistent with a credence of one in universalism. So let's dispel the myth that you have to believe in hell in order to take Pascal's wager. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. And I just wanted to make one quick comment on that. And it's like, when you say levels of heaven, um, we're not like, you know, we're not like positing like different like layers, but rather like there are different ways. You're, you're essentially saying that there might be different ways to um, experience God in the afterlife. I mean, just as people on earth who are even in relationships with God have varying fruits from their relationships and and uh, are, are varyingly close to God and things like that. Some are more profound than others, even though they're both in relationship with God. Maybe that would be the case with the afterlife. Maybe someone who, I don't know, like maybe maybe the Pascal's Wager would motivate someone to, um, you know, gain a, a, a kind of greater level of heaven in the sense of more profound fruits from your relationship with God or something like that. So uh, that's that's my contribution to the speed round. Let's go on to Pascal's mugger. I know it, that one's a little bit long, but um, in Pascal's mugging, well, here's here's kind of the, uh, I know I'm stealing your thunder, but in Pascal's mugging, right, there's like two premises and a conclusion. The first premise is in Pascal's mugging, we're going to tell the basic story in a second, but in Pascal's mugging, you ought not wager. That is, give the mugger your wallet. Premise two, Pascal's mugging is relevantly similar to Pascal's wager. And so conclusion thus in Pascal's Pascal's wager, you ought not wager. That is, believe in God. And so um, Pascal's mugging, maybe you could just tell us the quick story and then give us some quick responses. Sorry, I, I know like it will, there are lots of responses that you can give, but um, yeah, I'll just turn it over to you. Totally. So I love this one. I think it's so fun. So Pascal's mugging is this. Pascal's walking down the road, you know, maybe it's a little bit late at night. He just like got a drink with some of his friends um, and he's in a dark alley and a mugger comes up to him and says, Pascal, give me your wallet. And then Pascal's like, I don't really see you have a weapon or anything and you're pretty scrawny. Like, wh like why should I give you my wallet? And the mugger's like, dang it. Um, um, if you give me your wallet today, I will deposit $10 million into your bank account tomorrow. And then Pascal's like, hmm, there is $200 in my wallet and some credit cards and I'd have to get a new ID, but like, there's at least some probability he's not lying and he's going to deposit all that money in my wallet tomorrow. So, you know, take that probability, it might be low, but then multiply it by that huge number and, oh, it seems like it's worth, I'll just give him my wallet. And so it's this paper by Nick Bostrom and then like the last slide is like Pascal hands his, his wallet over to the mugger and walks away. So it's a fun story. I like it. Um, but yeah, you, you laid out the objection exactly like, look, Clearly, you shouldn't give this mugger your wallet. Clearly, he's lying to you. But then what about the person that thinks, like, clearly all, like, all religions, even if there's some probability they're true, they're just really unlikely. Like, this just can't be right. You know what I mean? Um, like, 
like how like how is that not similar to the mugging case so premise two pascal's wager is relevantly similar to pascal's mugging and so then it seems like we shouldn't take the wager either um so i guess i'll just really briefly say what i think the two main responses are um response one has to do with sort of the nature of decision theory and how we decide what to do with decision theory and basically what you say is as the mugger makes these more and more extreme claims about putting more and more money into your bank account or doing like, you know, he could say I'll murder thousands of people or hundreds or millions of people tomorrow if you don't give me your wallet. You know, we could even make it like a moral thing or something. Um, as those claims get more extreme, your credence that the mugger is lying should lower in proportion. And if if you think, I think that's kind of plausible. Like if he's like, I'll give you 10 bucks tomorrow. It's like, well, maybe he really would. I don't know. Like at least that's not as implausible as like 15 million. And then that's not as implausible as I can push this button and, and kill, destroy the world or something, you know? So as these claims get more extreme, I think it's kind of plausible your credence should get lower. Um, but then we can kind of basically use decision theory to show that um, we actually we actually shouldn't take the mugger, we shouldn't take the mugger's offer. Um, but I think in this case, Pascal's wager wouldn't be relevantly similar because I don't think when a religion makes a claim about heaven, you should like lower your credence in proportion in the same way. At least it's not obvious that that would be like a similarity between the wager and the mugger. So we can say like, don't give the mugger your wallet. Look, as he makes these more extreme claims, your credence should lower. But in Pascal's wager, it's not obvious that if I make a claim about heaven, um, you're you're gonna like just discount what I'm saying. I mean, maybe some people would, but I think it's interesting to look at like the data about like children who are born like believing in an afterlife and you know stuff like that. So I guess it's at least not totally obvious that same thing would apply to Pascal's wager. And then um, I guess really quick, the second response is when we look at these cases where there's this low probability of getting this really good thing, but you have to pay that that some cost. You know, the wallet, low probability getting all the money, the wager low probability, but you could go to heaven, but you still have to pay that cost of like committing to God or believing in God or whatever. Um, so when you look at those cases, it's not clear that taking the mugger's offer or taking Pascal's wager is irrational in all of them. So think about a case where <coughs> Um, someone is worried about like this crazy global warming thing happening like in the next five years. Like it would be super, super bad, but it is admittedly kind of unlikely. To me, it's not totally obvious that it would be irrational to donate to that. Uh, maybe give that charity like a hundred bucks and help them fight this low probability, but potentially totally disastrous cause. Um, also charities that uh, try to work to prevent like nuclear, potential nuclear wars could fall into this category. You could think about a more personal example, like taking some, paying a lot of money for some medicine that has a low probability of saving you from some terrible illness that maybe you've been like struggling with your whole life, right? So here's the, the basic thought, like some of these cases are clearly rational, right? Um, Pascal's wager and Pascal's mugging are two of these cases. Pascal's mugging seems like it falls on the irrational side, but you need to give me some argument that Pascal's wager would fall on the irrational side rather than the rational side. So that's basically my second response. Sweet. Okay. Well, uh, you've been very gracious with your time. Thank you so much for this. That was really wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming on. Do you have any final words about uh, Pascal's wager or anything? Or no, this was just this was super fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, super super great to to banter and just talk philosophy with you. I cannot believe we've been talking for an hour and forty minutes. If anyone makes <laughs> it this far, you are awesome. Gold star to you. <laughs> um, I'm sure people will. I feel like there's people that that it's crazy like on YouTube you wouldn't think like super long videos would do well but they actually do so yep. I'm, sure, mm -hmm. I'm sure some people will but anyway thanks so much for having me on this was a lot of fun and maybe we could do it again and talk about belief in credence or something <laughs> sweet yeah that sounds good so uh yeah uh everyone thanks for watching I'm Joe Schmidt this is the majesty of reason and peace out